Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my guest is Graham Stewart. He's uh, what's called the EVP at Fiber. 52, F-I-B-R-E, 52. We're going to talk about how cotton has been processed pretty much the same way for 80 years. And uh, Graham has come up with a, a sustainable solution to uh, bleach, bleaching and dyeing cotton. So we're going to talk about that and more. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Graham. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you, too. It's uh, it's great to be here. And yeah, th thanks for inviting me on, on your pod. Yeah, no problem. I saw in your bio, you've been in the cotton industry for like 40 plus years. Very, very long time. What's a bit about your background? Like, how did you get interested in this field and what have you done in your career? Yeah, Richard, I, I started yeah, over 40 years ago. I think I, I kind of had to be in this industry, in the textile industry. It wasn't just cotton. I was born in a wool town. You know, where I lived was the largest dye stuff maker in the world, Imperial Chemical Industries. They invented Many of the dyes that are used today, and particularly when we come into talking about cotton, the reactive dyes were invented by ICI, you know, 200 yards from where I lived. And that was uh, back in the in the 1950s. And those are the biggest group of dye stuffs used on cotton today. And they've evolved a bit, but, you know, the basic chemistry is the same. So I kind of had to be this business because the town had 100 mills. And where I was born, we, we were actually a mill house and all, all my family worked there. Or you could either work in the dye stuff making up operation or you could work in the mills and that was about it in in, in my town so th that's what attracted me was the the fact that the dye stuffs were being made so closely and that attracted me to chemistry so when i left school i went straight to study dyeing and chemistry interesting so cotton what's it what is the process by which it is grown harvested and then turned into the various clothing that we wear maybe just take a quick overview of it for folks that don't know yeah um i'm not involved in the agriculture in cotton, but I do know a little bit. Of course, c cotton does come under scrutiny because there's a lot of uh, a lot of water used, chemicals, you know, pesticides, which is getting very quickly cleaned up. There's no doubt about it, but cotton is demanding for water. And we'll come on to, you know, why that affects Fiber 52 um, or what Fiber 52 can do th for that in the whole supply chain, I should say. But cotton is grown in certain parts of the world. We're, we're fortunate here in the America has such a rich heritage in cotton. And my, my partners are based in Houston, Texas. Texas is the largest grower of cotton in America. And I believe oh. it accounts for about 50% of America's cotton. So 
the cotton growing industry is still large here. Uh, other areas would be China, India, Egypt, different qualities. And yeah, where we really come in with Fibre 52 is where cotton begins to be processed. So it goes from its raw state when it's been collected into what we call a cotton gin. That ginned product goes to a spinner, to spin a yarn. And the largest cotton spinner in the world, Parkdale Mills, is based in, in America, in fact, not far from me, in North Carolina. But they have they have big spinning plants all over the world. Fantastic. It would be, uh, would be cool if they had a gin called Cotton Gin. I don't know if they do, but the name <laughs> came to mind. Uh, well, I'd certainly drink it, yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting. But okay. Yeah. Sure. So, all right. So they they harvest it and they'll spin it into what form? Like what you know? What are the stages again that it goes through until it becomes a garment? In 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 yarn form, there are different spinning methods. So the the longer, stronger, more expensive cottons and the cleaner cottons are ring spun. So that's a, a a stronger spinning system. So if you look at your fine cotton sheets, your fine cotton shirts, that's that kind of cotton. If you look at something like your average cotton sock um, or a very average cotton t-shirt, I mean very average, you know, the mass market cotton t-shirts, they're open end spun. So the ring spuns are combed. So it's a finer, yeah, it's a finer wave uh, spinning cotton. The open end yarns are what we call carded. So they go through these huge carding machines. And usually then you're dealing with shorter cottons, less strength, and also, our process gets a lot of interest there because we don't damage the cotton with the Fiber 52 process. This happens with traditional cotton, and it leaves that weaker open-end yarn in a much stronger state. It doesn't add strength, but it doesn't weaken it. Hmm. Okay. And, and to answer your question, then, there are many, many other stages after that. You know, we can branch out into the textile industry, but, you know, for apparel, for their wovens, knitted cottons, both in the T-shirt that we wear, that I wear and you wear, to the sweaters that we wear, to cotton woven pants, you know. So, and even the upholstery, the home furnishings that we uh, that we all use, cotton's a big deal there too. Hmm. Okay, so this is the process that's been going on for uh, decades and decades. For what I believe you said, eighty years in your notes. Yeah, probably more. You know, the cotton process in that I've studied over the years. You know, undoubtedly, cotton processing has advanced, it has evolved, but over those years, the fundamentals have stayed the same, and that is using very heavy alkali as opposed to acid, the very heavy alkali with very high pH, which Mm. damages the cotton. And the reason that that high alkali is used, or heavy alkali is used, is to get what the industry lovingly calls the trash out of the cotton. So in putting caustic soda, for instance, onto cotton, which is a heavy alkali, it saponifies the waxes in the cotton, but it takes out the vegetable matter that is what's called trash in the cotton to make the cotton look cleaner. And also that's part of the bleaching process to make cotton whiter because cottons can be even quite brown in their nature depending on the quality of them the better cottons tend to be whiter in the beginning but these processes are to make cotton cleaner and whiter okay what are some of the innovations in cotton manufacture that have occurred or there really hasn't been any a- anything with mixing with other fibers i don't know what, like what are some of the innovations in it yeah, you can see over the years over the decades where there's been other innovations in textiles so the invention of nylon, for instance, was a big one. Cotton became blended with nylon to, for strength, and nylon became fashionable. Then, around the same time, the viscose rayons the, are very widespread. The viscose rayons de- generally made from wood pulp, for instance. The bigger brands will be like Nordal that you can you see in the you know the uh, big fashion stores around the world. That's cellulose, so very easy to blend with cotton and in fact was invented even as a replacement for cotton. The downside is that even that isn't very strong, but it's beautiful, it's soft. Then polyester polyester came about, which was a big part of my background. In you know, we, My company, we were one of the first to dye polyester, and polyester is now the largest fibre in the world by volume used, but cotton is a close send. And I haven't really thought about it. I think in volume, cotton may even be bigger than polyester, but I, I, I don't know that for, for sure. So yeah, cotton and poly or polyester 
are really the two largest fibers that are used around the globe. What what are what are preferential mixes with cotton, and what are the properties? Like if I mix cotton and polyester, and I have like five percent polyester, you know, what would that be like versus uh, cotton and something else at you know a fifty fifty ratio? Like, is there a, a much difference in material properties depending on the mix of of different garments? Yeah, there's trade offs there. Five percent wouldn't do a great deal, so probably not worth bothering with. But you know, it happens. Whereas you know, you're on the edge. From a strength standpoint, adding some polyester will help that. So you do see T-shirts with 5 and 10% added. If you go to 50%, then quite often the guys that sell cheaper performance products, so cheaper sporting goods products that you'll see in these big sporting goods stores, that again is to add strength. And you know people talk about the wicking properties because polyester is not absorbent at all. So... The people selling it tend to say that it wicks moisture away. Cotton is very absorbent in the way that it's processed with the heavy alkalis, but that's one thing that alkali process aims to do is to make cotton very, very absorbent. And something we can talk about is that one of the side effects of fiber 52, and we can do it both ways, we can make cotton absorbent in processing or we can make it water repellent, naturally water repellent. So it can be hydrophilic absorbent or hydrophobic repellent. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, what about some of the, you know, what, what else can you do with the cotton? Like for sportswear, you know, where it wicks away moisture, you know, like what are, what are some of the properties and trade-offs of the different mixes of various synthetics with cotton? So uh, cotton's very absorbent, which is not the greatest thing for sport. For comfort, yeah. If you're wearing it around your home, lounging around in it, sleeping on it, you know, it's wonderful. For strength, again, that's where polyester really comes in. And for those guys who want to think that polyester is wicking moisture, that's great. But what I can tell you is that we or I discovered in the invention of Fiber 52, if I can call it that, was a side effect where we're not taking the natural waxes away from cotton or the natural properties away from cotton. And in that hydrophobic state what we found we, we did some big trials with nc state university who have an amazing lab probably one of the best if not the best in the world it's a comfort lab they did a big test on our fiber 52 versus polyester and versus traditional cotton and what came out of that was incredible and so some of the largest sporting goods brands in the world are working with us on Fiber 52 because what we've got is a constant comfort factor. We thought it was hydrophobic. We found that it's actually absorbing moisture and then releasing it, uh, but it doesn't saturate. And therefore, it stays comfortable on your body, doesn't stick to your body like polyester does. And so in the tests that we did, we found that polyester starts to wick moisture very, very well. Then there's a crash, bang. And anyone who's in sport and there's warm polyester in warm weather, you do know that that polyester product is going to stick to your body. Yes. It, it then sticks you fairly quickly. And that was shown in the comfort lab testing. Uh, and, and it's like Mount Everest. You know, the graph, the graph went up as it was wicking moisture and then came down the other side just as fast. Cotton's like a little molehill in that it saturates real quick. So it cools you down to begin with. It gets rid of some moisture, but then it's so absorbent, it goes again within, it can be within minutes, as we probably know, if you're out there running, cycling, whatever, in humid, hot conditions, bang, sticks to your skin. Fiber 52, it went up as it wicks the moisture, and then it flatlined for an hour and a half as the moisture keeps getting expelled and taken away naturally from the body. So that that was a big one and something that I didn't expect. So where is the uh, this new uh, fiber mix going to be used? What, what, what do you think is the ideal application for it? Uh, it's not a fiber mix. That's up to that's up to the manufacturers. They want to put polyester with cotton. That that's that's fine. As far as we're concerned, what happens is we're using bioproduct to bleach and dye cotton. Cotton has to be bleached anyway to begin with to get the nice colours that we all like to wear. And and to and to an extent, that's what we do, but with bioproducts and biocatalysts. So basically, in that processing, what we bring to cotton, which I think is quite important, is the, a much faster processing time, much lower temperatures, much gentler, a much gentler process that saves 
also an enormous amount of water, which is really important around the world. You know, that's our big commitment to cotton. So our carbon footprint can be up to half normal cotton processing, but also the strength of cotton is normally 15 to 20% higher using the Fibre 52 process. So that, that's what we bring to cotton, but we also bring those performance attributes if you if you need them. You know what? Uh, cotton seems to... This is a question for you. It's kind of funny, but I've gotten over the years, I've gotten some really, really big shirts and washed them. And it doesn't always happen, but when they're pure cotton, sometimes they shrink like crazy, like a third of their their previous length shrinks. And where, where does the material go? Does the fiber just arrange in a tighter pattern or like how does cotton shrink and why yeah that that's due to the stability of the fabric and what you'll find is certainly in the poorer cottons and the ones that have been carded if the if the dyers don't finish the cotton properly or don't have the machinery to finish then you get you can get really considerable shrinkage and you're right Richard, that that's happened to all of us I think um you know I used to also be very much involved in the wool industry where Shrinkage really is a problem, and you know wool has to be treated chemically to get rid of that that shrinkage. In cotton, what you tend to do is to relax the cotton or the cotton fabric, so that all that relaxation's gone. The problem you had is the relaxation hadn't gone, and then you put it in the washing machine, and the relaxation happens, and you know you give it to your uh, younger brother because it's not going to fit you anymore. What do they mean relaxation? So when a cotton is knitted, so think of your normal T-shirt, then it, there's when when it goes on a, a knitting machine, then there are rows, you, you can actually see it, that there are what are called whales and courses in technical terms where the, the cotton is, is kind of plied together, cotton yarn, to form a stitch. So you're forming a stitch pattern. If that stitch pattern hasn't been compacted to stop it from shrinkage, then it's unstable. And so that instability, once it gets in your washing machine, is taken out. The result, guess what? Shrinkage, and it can be and it can be considerable. Why does it shrink? What's happening with the cotton to cause it to shrink? And where? How is it it's restructuring? Not, it's not the cotton; it's the knit itself. So the knit itself is relaxing. So there's a lot of tension. Once you when you knit something, you're knitting this enormous amount of tension, and the dyes in fabric. You have to take that tension away. If it's not taken away, and it happens, that's what you're going to get. The tension, the tension disappears in your washing machine into, and causes. What, what is when when cotton is like? I'm wearing a cotton shirt right now. I'm looking at it kind of close. I see the lines in it and everything. What's what else is in my shirt besides cotton? Let's say it's a you know white shirt. Like what is this knit you're talking about? Is it just the way the cotton is woven around itself, or is there a different material that well uh, is mixed in with the cotton? Yeah, knits and wovens are entirely different. So your woven, you know, your normal woven, let's say Brooks Brothers shirt, which is a beautiful shirt, doesn't shrink much because it's it's tightly woven, and so there is no relaxation. If you understand a knitted shirt, the nice stretchy knitted polos that you that you wear, that we all wear, that's where the shrinkage exists. Back to what I've just said. If you don't take the relaxation out of the knit, the result is shrinkage. So you've, it, it, in textile terms, it's called dimensional stability. And so when you produce cotton, you need to measure that dimensional stability, which usually means that it shouldn't shrink less than 5 or 6% in either direction. What you're getting is like 20%, 30% right. shrinkage. I hope that explains it, Richard. Without getting too the, deep into the, the material weeds. must be must be bunching up and getting more dense if it shrinks. Let's say it shrinks like thirty percent. I mean, it doesn't like evaporate into thin air. So I would think like the resulting density or porosity of the cotton is a lot less because it's got to go somewhere. It shrinks into like a smaller footprint, right? Not not really. Uh, let me give no. you the no. Let me give you the parallels between wool and cotton. So wool on its surface has these little barbs. Right, on what's called the epicuticle of wool it has these little barbs, and we've all seen it. You know, in your granddad's sweater, you throw that in the washing machine, and it it felts up, right? You know, and in the olden days, twenty thirty years ago, there was something called total easy care, which was invented by the wool industry, which took the barbs off wool. Cotton doesn't have that. 
Cotton doesn't have that. So cotton itself is not shrinking. Again, it's back to the physical property of a knitted cotton. That's shrinking. So it's a physical issue. And so a normal, a normal cotton shirt is just stretched cotton. And when it shrinks, it's no longer stretched like it was. Is that right? Correct. Spot on. Yeah, you got it, Richie. But again, once it's, and when it's in a stretched state... I would think that it's, you know, the layer of it is thinner. And once it goes to a relaxed state, it would thicken up. It wouldn't necessarily ball up, but, you know, the average thickness of the shirt, I think, would, it seems like it would increase and it would get more dense. Yeah. You know, the cotton that's side by side, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you look in process, what tends to happen on the on a knitted fabric is you stretch it out on a, on a machine with pins to 60 inches wide, right? And that, then you make sure that you relax that the best you can under certain conditions, and then you've taken the shrinkage out of that. However, if you don't achieve that for any reason, exactly what you say, the garment is going to be smaller, but it's going to be the same weight as the big one, right? So you've got a denser a denser product. So you're absolutely right in that. Well, how does that change the material properties, the you know the moisture passage, et cetera, of a uh, relaxed versus a non-relaxed uh, shirt, let's say? Not much. Uh, in a normal cotton shirt, it saturates just as quickly as normal. So, you know, maybe if you've got your very badly shrunk shirt, it will it will probably saturate quicker than the one that's more breathable. But that's the only difference. They're both going to mm-hmm. saturate real quick. Is there something that can be added to a cotton shirt in low percentage where it still has the desirable properties for wear, but the relaxation will be much less? Uh, yeah, you can put certain finishes onto onto cotton to to achieve that. They tend to be environmentally unfriendly, so they're legislate they are legislated against now. And I can tell you, you know, that's my life in that in sustainable cotton processing. What we can see is that there's definitely there's definitely uh, legislation coming down the line. You know, the regulatory landscape is continuing to evolve. And that, from an industry point of view, means, you know, increased reporting and so on on what you've got on your garment, what that does to your body, right? And a lot of those products that have been applied over the years are now not aligned. They're not allowed to be applied. And there's um, an organization which we're becoming a member of, which is uh, ZDHC, which is, you know, zero discharge. So that also monitors the chemicals on your product, and also the processing. So the discharge of chemicals within processing. So you can't put those chemicals on. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot out there about fluorocarbons, for instance, you know, like um, PTFE or uh, the nonstick pan, uh, you know, yeah. the nonstick pan issue. Those same, chemi- those same chemicals are still being applied to textiles, not just cotton. And they are being legislated against in certain way, in a big way. But some of them some of them are allowed and some are friendlier than others. The ones that wash off are friendlier than others. The ones that stay on, I think that they will soon disappear. So I hope, hope that answers your question. Well, actually, it brings to mind something. You know, some people talk about embedding sensors and clothing, and we may be going out in the left field, so forgive me if we are, but would cotton be a good base layer in which to embed sensors or to do something to the cotton so that it could sense uh, moisture or other compounds coming from sweat or whatever, In a, you know, in, in, to become a wearable sensor? Are you, are you working on any of that stuff or aware of it? I'm definitely not work, work, working on any of that stuff. I've seen it in the past where I've worked with the military. For instance, wool is possibly the best, but polyester is good because it's not absorbent. But basically what you're trying to do, if you're putting electrical sensors inside a textile, it's not a good idea if that textile saturates. So I, I definitely wouldn't recommend knit, knitted cotton, but woven cottons don't saturate as much. So, you know, there is... There is an argument for using, yeah, for using woven cons for for that for that usage, and yeah, it's a good question because let's face it, that's just going to happen more and more and more as uh, you know as, the, as as those electronic sensors evolve. What's the difference between a like? How do I know if I'm wearing woven or knit cot? What kind of garments are made from which kind of uh, material processing method? So take your, as I said, you know, take a a, a shirt from a company like Brooks Brothers where you've got these beautiful shirts that go really nice with your suit and you wear a tie with them, right, if you wish. But that's your classical cotton shirt. 
or the bed linens that you sleep on, when mm. you often you'll often see their advertisers three hundred count or three hundred thread. Some of that is not factual, but usually what they say, and I don't think it's legislated, but what usually, you know, the higher the count, you know, if you go from a 100 to a 300, the 300 is much finer, and those are woven. So those are mainly woven. When you go and get your, you know, your Ralph Lauren polo with a, with a nice collar, you go play golf in it or whatever you do, you know, go to dinner in it, and it's nice and stretchy. That's your knitted product. Also, the sweaters that you wear, which cotton sweaters are plentiful. Those beautiful cotton sweaters are stretchy and, you know, they, they go over your T-shirt, for instance, and the T-shirts themselves, they're all knitted. So that's the difference between the two. So what is it? Uh, it just feels, uh, so what feels nicer to people, woven or knitted, or does it depend on the application? Yeah. Which one feels which way and how so? It depends on the application. It depends on the look. I mean, this is where, you know, if you're if you're attending a formal dinner, you're probably not going to wear your t-shirt, right? And if you want to put a tie around it, your tie with a t-shirt at a formal dinner probably not such a great look. But if you're going casual, you know, and you're going for a, a, a night out, you know, or you're strolling around and you're out in the evening, your cotton t-shirt, your stretchy cotton t-shirts, fabulous, yeah. Providing it's not too hot, then you have to think of something else. But uh, that that's the difference. It's the formal look. Versus the informal look. And of course, you know, woven formal shirts also look great. And, you know, like me, I'll probably, because it's so hot here where I am tonight, if I'm meeting, you know, somebody formally for dinner, I probably have an open neck shirt and short sleeves. That can be woven too. So not easy to explain, but the formal look and the informal look are usually different because the formal look is woven. The informal look is more often than not knitted. Okay, so you would expect like higher quality garments to be woven and lower quality ones probably knitted. No, not at all. I mean, you, so for instance, if you take beautiful Eg- Egyptian cotton shirt or a, a, a Pima cotton, in America we grow also a Supima, I think it's called, where it's a longer, beautiful staple cotton and the diameter of the cotton is much finer, if you understand. So the diameter is smaller than the cheaper cottons. So these more expensive cottons if you knit them, you probably see a beautiful sheen on them, and you're probably going to pay about two hundred to three hundred dollars for for your polo instead of fifty, sixty. But yeah, you can't differentiate on price between knitted and woven. Hmm. Okay, okay. I think I've got you. Interesting. So, any big changes coming in the uh, you know the cotton industry, the garment industry, besides going towards more uh, more sustainable practices? Are there any um, again big innovations that you see coming? Yeah, I think the innovations, one big innovation is actually uh, information. When you go in a store and buy a t-shirt or a sweater or your pants, a suit, whatever, there's not that much information. Certainly going back 10 years, there wasn't that much information about where your textile comes from, both in the fabric itself and who actually made that garment and what the country of origin is. So that visibility is becoming a big deal. And so consumers... A demand in that, that will be a huge change in the industry. Okay. Well, very good. Graham, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? Yeah, fiber52.com. Real simple. So it's spelled F-I-B-R-E 52.com. Fiber52.com. And what we're doing is we're putting more and more information on that website, both for industry. At the moment, we're very industry focused, but we're also putting more and more in the consumer domain, more information as we were just speaking of. And we're helping brands and manufacturers to get that information out into the public domain and out to the consumer. Okay. Maybe you'll do your own line of special clothing instead of like Martha Stewart, it'll be Graham Stewart, you know? <laughs> I'd love to think so, yeah. But uh, yeah, with uh, with Fiber with Fiber 52, our endeavor is to, you know, continue with Fiber 52 in in a really what is an ingredient brand in that we're adding value to the the fabrics and so on we wouldn't go out and compete against our customers by having a you know a fiber 52 or forbid it a graham a graham stewart brand that that's not going to happen <laughs> well, i was sorry to hear it but but thank you graham for coming on the podcast it's a really interesting subject and uh now i i finally have solved the mystery of why my clothes shrink all the time sometimes like multiple times so thank you 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, good, good wearing for the future. Hope, hope your clothes don't shrink. And thanks for inviting me on the pod, Richard. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.